for the entire institute and until the time that uh, that it became uh, uh, the center that we are part of now um, <clears throat> we have big plans uh, this is what our plan is to have 100000 square feet space um, connected together including a renovated space here um, <clears throat> of which right now we probably have about half of it so we, we still need to get the other half built and connected 25 years have been a long time and i think we are doing all right um, we are the youngest of the top three design schools in the country by qs ranking and we are younger than the closest by 25 years or more um, in design research we are uh, ahead of uh, other schools this is a quick scorecard of the journey. You know, we have graduated over 400 uh, MDA students, and more recently we started an intake in smart manufacturing. Graduated about 20 students, maybe 18. And uh, one of our strengths is that all of these have a strong uh, grounding, grounding in research. And we had, uh, we have graduated large number of students. Uh, right now there are 65. Uh, PhD or MTech research students here. Uh, we also have a lot of patents. Uh, that's 65 or more patents. That roughly translates to about 30% patents, 30% uh, of the projects in the entire MDES uh, MTech period. You know, our MTech was very small for about 14 years, about 10, and then it became more. So taking all of that, it's actually quite a respectable number. Um, our students and our faculty have made us proud with many awards, Red Dot Award, uh, Dyson Award, uh, uh, mentioned in 25 Best Inventions of the World in Time Magazine, um, many other awards, uh, you can see it there. Uh, and, and a variety of different projects for which those awards are received, going from insulin pump that is affordable for children all the way to organ carriers and uh, you know a robot that scoops out sewage from stuck uh, sewage canals underneath the ground and so on um, oh sorry and then uh, many of them have actually gone on to do their startups I'm just trying to see what's okay. So grass bionics, for ex for example, is is a startup on prosthetics, uh, arm prosthetics. Um, Cycle Innovations is another, and there are many others right now uh, that are getting incubated. Uh, this is a robot robot interaction for human cooperative package delivery uh, from uh, Professor Abro Rajudri's lab. And a lot of research students, we started the first PhD program in the country in design uh, with uh, the person doing PhD was a staff member, Dr. Pradeep Yamiyavar, uh, who graduated, uh, I think, in 1999. And then he moved on to IIT Guwahati and was instrumentally starting their uh, PhD program there. Uh, CPD has been carrying that mantle. And all these students you can see here are now professors or assistant professors and so on elsewhere. Many more. This is just a, just a sample. So we pursue excellence in uh, design and manufacturing to support what we call systemically complex, technologically intensive, and socially impactful solutions. And we try to do that by bringing together the functional, the aesthetic, and the usable and the sustainable. And uh, our mission is to develop professionals, leaders, innovate products and develop knowledge. Develop knowledge is particularly an area where I think we excel. And our students have also gone on to make us proud. Uh, so it's an average department by the size of departments in the institute, which is roughly 10 faculty, 100 students kind of departments. We are about that, 11 faculty and 120 students or so, about 120 students. Uh, we have very strong connect to the uh, rest of the institute through associate faculty, participating faculty, and so on. 
uh, also we initiated uh, the first design observatory in india that can observe how design takes place and then learn from that and make it better uh, first map smart factory in india first plm conference uh, first international design research conference and so on um, we also lead the national design innovation network uh, we are one of the first design innovation center hubs uh, funded by both funded by ministry of education uh, technology business incubator in geriatric healthcare even first in the country and also uh, a smart factory that is funded by ministry of heavy industries uh, as i said we have several conference series the first one i called is in design and the second one i forum is in manufacturing so with that i pass on the agenda to professor vishal thank you uh, so agenda is already shared with everyone so i'll go quickly through it we are already a bit delayed in starting uh, here are the speakers so uh, two of the speakers uh, as has been the uh, norm here two are here two are uh, online uh, dr unofi was um, supposed to be here but then she fell ill and that's why she is uh, online so uh, going uh, before we sort of start i'll just sort of very quickly sort of uh, recap uh, how we plan to i mean what these events are about and what we plan to do here so one of the objectives of course was to bring uh, who we celebrate as people who have been design experts either in research or practice who have had an influence uh, so these people have become our cpdm design ambassadors and that's how we look at them uh, and uh, one of the objectives was to get 100 people over these 25 events to talk about design uh, and so that it gets recorded it's available to people as a documented thing over youtube in addition what we want to do is that after these 25 events we will publish a book based on what has been said by these 100 people about design so we sort of work around a template of questions and hopefully that becomes a interesting coffee table book for people to look at and uh, refer to so so that's with that note uh, i'll get started uh, what we'll do is we'll invite our online speakers first uh, just to make it easier for us to manage it so i'll start with uh, dr uh, unofi rosarina uh, so unofi is a behavioral scientist uh, who did a phd from uh, Switzerland, and uh, she is currently working with uh, Swiggy. Uh, she is also actively in involved as the founder and CEO of uh, India Behavioral Economics Network, uh, a vibrant non-profit uh, organization promoting behavioral economics in Indian subcontinent. Uh, I'm keeping it short. I'm hoping uh, she can talk about herself as well a bit uh, as she gives her part of the talk. So, Unofi, if we can have your talk uh, for the next ten minutes. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Great. Just give me a moment. Let me just uh, get my screen organized here. Yeah, if you can share your screen, I'll stop sharing. The audio is you know, if you can hear us. Yes, yes. Sorry. Oh, by the way, it's Junofi or Unofi. So I'm sorry. I've. Uh, <laughs> it's Junofi. Junofi. All right. Sorry about that. So this is my Finnish influence a bit. That uh, habit hasn't gone yet. <laughs> That's fine. I get called by all kinds of names. I'm pretty much used to it now. Um, Great, thanks everyone. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the intersection of behavioral science and design. Uh, I'll keep it really short, hopefully shorter than ten minutes. So, uh, as it was told earlier, I unfortunately fell ill. Uh, otherwise, I would have been there. Um, just to give a very quick context, it was already sort of given, but I work as a behavioral scientist at Swiggy and UNICEF, and I'm also the founder of India Behavioral Economics Network. and in the past i've consulted with a lot of organizations i've worked with various organizations and yeah that'll just give you an idea on what, what kind of questions you could direct at me awesome so let me start off by giving a little bit of brief about what behavioral sciences then we'll talk about the intersection 
and um, I'll just touch a little bit upon ethics as well. I thought those two would be interesting later on when we come to the panel. Um, great. So behavioral science is sort of an intersection of psychology and microeconomics. So microeconomics is the part of economics that deals with game theory, preferences and all of that. And I myself come from an economics background. Um, so we sort of put in the how brain works to how people make decisions and link it up, which basically helps us understand how exactly people are making decisions, right? And of course, the good part of that is when you know how people make decisions, you can also influence people's decision. We'll talk about that a little bit more, but the ability to influence someone's decision is extremely powerful. And uh, yeah, let me start off with like a quick story. So there was this loads of instant cake mixes that became very popular and it's very easy to use. You just mix a little bit of water and you can literally bake it. It's it's as simple as that. But unfortunately, not many people bought these instant cake mixes and people were trying to figure out what's happening. How do we make it even easier? Like are there clumps when people are mixing it? How do we make it even easier? Do we already give them a paste and all of that? People were really trying to figure out what to do. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard these anecdotes and you can see it in the picture. The thing that fixed it was um, asking people to add their own egg. So what happened here was you just give them the powder and they add their own egg, beat it up and then make the cake. And in this case, a lot more started getting sold. And this brings us like an interesting way of thinking. Imagine you make a cake, you bake a cake and you give it to your family and typically in those times and also unfortunately in these times uh, women are the ones who bake the cake right and in a lot of families and these women when they go give the cake to their family they're going to ask who made the cake did you bake it and to say yes i did it just adding water and baking it doesn't feel like you did it right so maybe adding a little bit of eggs helps this is also called IKEA effect in behavioral science, which basically says that when you build something or when you make something, you also value it a lot more. And you also, in this case, find it tastier. Humans are odd. That's what I'm trying to conclude here. We sometimes like it when things are easier. We sometimes do more of what is actually more difficult to do. So the standard economics theories and all of that claim that humans are this super rational Spock kind of person. But the reality is sort of, it's sort of like Homer in case someone watches Simpsons. But basically, this is like the too long don't read version of behavioral science. It's just that humans are not rational. And using this irrationality, what all can we do is sort of what behavioral science covers. Why are we not, not rational? Let's talk about that just for a second. We make about 35,000 decisions every day. Just, just try and picture making all of these 35,000 decisions consciously, like trying and figuring out the cost benefit of these decisions and all of that. It's just going to be extremely tiring and let's be honest, impossible, right? So our brain pretty much always runs on an autopilot and we make decisions using what in behavioral science we call system one thinking. So system one thinking is a kind of thinking. Let's, let's, start with that way, but technically it's sort of a gradient from system one to system two. It's not two different things, but system one thinking is the kind of thinking where you're just going by your intuition. You're not really sitting and processing it. You're just doing whatever you feel the right thing to do is. And this is how we make 95% of our decisions. So pretty much most of the decisions we're making every day is using system one. And system two thinking is more of the rational thinking where we're slow, effortful and all of that. So what has been happening? Our brain is like running on autopilot and we're using these mental shortcuts in behavioral science, we call this heuristics. And when these heuristics lead to bad preferences, we call it biases. I wanted to talk a little bit about the evolutionary side of things, but I think we can just skip that. Just a quick thought exercise. Try and think of what all factors one would take into account while it's using a shampoo from a store. What What's all the possibilities? Like you look at the color, you look at the price, the brand, the ingredients, what kind of hair is it for? How does it smell? How, what color? Like everything, right? But how do we actually make decisions? What's the reality? There's a lot of studies that show that people, in fact, stick to the same brand they've been using since their childhood for soaps and shampoos and toothpaste. And that's how, that's how stagnant our brain is mainly because we're not thinking we're just going on autopilot right and 
the good thing is that this is a very cool quote. I really like it. It says our irrational behavior is neither random nor senseless. This is systematic. We all make the same types of mistakes over and over. The product opportunity lies in helping people not make those mistakes, right? So the good thing is that we're doing the same thing over and over, which basically means that we are irrational, but we are very predictably irrational. And Dan really also wrote a book on prediction, predictably irrational, which is a really cool book. Totally recommend it. All right, so let me talk about the intersection of design and behavioral science. I'm a behavioral scientist at Swiggy, so the design team folks, and we constantly have a conversation of what are you going to do, what are we going to do? And honestly, there is a lot of overlap. It, it, there is a huge overlap, right? So I'd like to typically to those folks, the way I say it is behavioral scientists are folks who kind of like make up for the lack of design skills using our understanding of human brain. So we have no design skills whatsoever, but uh, we know that how the behavioral science kind of talks about how a brain works and all of that. And on that note, despite behavioral science stemming from economics and that being a whole other field and all of that, I, I totally see behavioral science interacting a lot more with design as well right now, product itself. and system designs, everything, a lot of behavioral science is getting used. And that's a good sign. And for that, I think every design professional needs to really, really know behavioral science because it's important to know how the brain behind all those decisions actually works, right? And it's very predictable. And just imagine knowing exactly how your users will behave. And on that note, given that you can influence how people make decisions, Whatever you're doing, is that a positive influence or is it manipulation? Like what's okay, what's not okay? This is like a constant question that we have in behavioral science. Um, let's say at Swiggy, if I am helping you order faster, I'm doing a good thing, it's okay, right? However, let's say I'm trying to make you eat a lot of unhealthy food, that's not okay. So, you know, like where do we draw this line? And this line is pretty, you know, subjective and a very thin line. And it's very important to know where exactly we throw this line, draw this line, sorry. Um, with that, I'm going to wrap up. And Right, thank you. Thank you, Inufi. That's Inufi. Right, so uh, that was a wonderful start. Uh, I think we'll uh, park the questions for a later part. Uh, we'll just go with the uh, ten to, uh, five, four presentations. And then we'll come back to the questions uh, that the audience would have. I'm sure there are plenty on behavioral sciences. We do talk about it and its importance a lot here. Uh, but yes, it will always be good to have uh, experts on behavioral science come and engage with us on a regular basis. So with that, I'll go to our next speaker, uh, Professor Chakravarti, BK Chakravarti. Just give me a moment to get his uh, bio up. Uh, I'll go very quickly again, uh, very briefly. Uh, so, Professor B.K. Chakravarti is a renowned, renowned design educator and researcher uh, with a distinguished career spanning over three decades. He's currently serving as a professor and dean at uh, the IDC, uh, Industrial Design Center at IIT Bombay. Uh, he's a specialist in areas of new product innovation, product styling and perception, creativity, design strategy, humanizing technology, collaborative uh, innovative methods, form and aesthetics, and uh, so on. Uh, he's... Um, He has a background in PhD from Department of Management Studies at IIT Delhi, uh, and uh, again, uh, very uh, well known uh, around the circles. I don't have to sort of go on on this, so I'll invite Professor Chakravarti to please uh, give his talk and talk about him as well. All yours. Yeah, I'm just getting unmuted. Yeah, I'm, uh, are you I'm audible. Perfect. So, like, that was a wonderful presentation. Uh, 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 you know, understanding behavioral economics and behavioral sciences, extremely good. So, like, uh, I'll quickly, you know, can you please uh, uh, give me a sharing of screen? Should have that access. Yeah, it's already there. I'll tap twice when we are close to the time, uh, the 10 minutes sort of. Thing. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, so I will, uh, uh, 
was not able to share and you know why i just check one minute ah now the role has been changed okay uh, press the show back on the enter full screen no after changing my role i'm not able to check the screen uh, keep my role as earlier ah uh, yeah got it got it got it yeah uh, there we go yeah are you able to see my screen uh is my screen visible yeah it is yeah thank you so much <laughs> i think the only audience is after our uh, you know <laughs> <the> actors <laughs> thank you so like it's, it's wonderful and so glad to see you know the achievements of uh, uh, you know the achievements of our uh, second how did my slide vanish Yeah, there we go. Uh, the uh, achievements of the uh, you know CPDM, and uh, very very glad to see uh, you know the, that uh, you know we got so many faculty alumni of CPDM in every sort of uh, uh, design school uh, in the country. So let me quickly start with my presentation. So you know. I come from industry. I, I you know I have seven years of experience in Larsen Tubro. I think when I came back to the design education, I said, you know, we have to work collaboratively. It's not possible to work in silos. And can we start that process of collaboration? You know, like very early in the design process. So that made us uh, set up the uh, design innovation uh, center. Uh, thanks to to our for alumnus, uh, you know, like uh, Shinoy uh, brothers. Uh, and we got this inaugurated through Montex Single Walia. Economics is the key, uh, as uh, it was, you know, we also said in the mod a, a little bit earlier. So we said, you know, innovation has to flourish, and we have to get funding. We have to get, you know, like uh, resources to develop everything together. So that, you know, is a key for our uh, work. And then, you know, we uh, did, uh, uh, you know, established 2008, and since then, a lot of, you know, interesting projects. uh both in the studio so what we learned you know in the design process is if i can bring experts along with professor guides into the studio then my student projects can go to market so we see a lot of technology and manufacturing happening at cpdm we we see all those labs coming up so we get in the expertise we have project associates we have phd students working so when we work together we come up with projects directly as you know into the market and that's what innovation app so you have to have a collaborative methodology for that so my phd has been in the area of collaborative innovation with my professor in the school of management so i very proudly say that i am an undergraduate mechanical engineer a post graduate industrial designer and a phd uh, you know in management studies so basically you know that sums it all up saying that how could you take uh, innovation forward uh, you know like uh, in the real world and 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 we also want to do it while we are in academics that's a challenge so here we have within two years how, we, how, how can we take uh, student projects to market uh, this is way we work we have you know expertise uh, thanks to the design innovation center along with indian institute of science we are also one of uh, one of the very early sort of uh, you know uh, uh, awardees of the uh, innovation uh, center and i'm also very proud to say that we were also one of the founders to send the proposal to the ministry uh, to set up these 20 centers because we had the studio uh, you know back then and sharmista who also wrote the proposal is currently teaching at iid guwahati and ashish who you see in the screen is currently teaching at nid so very very proud that you know we're also do, doing our bit to the service of academics so coming to the innovation journey innovation journey is like you know putting uh, multiple things together multiple technologies together multiple users together and you have a large number of users not multiple so here what we do is while our back end there you can see is working on products we have the you know like uh, front end now in the uh, screen working on creating online lectures for these so that's the whole you know uh, phenomenon so we are also the open design school of our ministry so i will quickly show you you know a small introductory video so that's that will sum it up all and then i will just introduce you if time permits to our seven concerns of innovation and then we'll go on uh, with questions uh, let me see if the video will play uh, is it playing vishal 
Uh, welcome to the Design Innovation Center at IIT Bombay. I'm extremely glad to present all the facilities over here in the Design Innovation Center, as well as the type of activities we are doing just to showcase how innovation can happen. We start with our uh, conference room where we display all our uh, projects which we have been working all along. I've been uh, working in Lassen and Tubro earlier and you can see these petrol pumps uh, which we call serial innovation ranging from you know uh, uh, like the Z-Line petrol pump to the bullet dispensers. We, you know we use the conference room very extensively for both our online courses as well as discussions. The current discussion which is happening in the uh, conference room is on the scripts and the animation needed for the open design school activity. The innovation studio needs to display all its projects so we've displayed most of our projects on our display stands over here. So from the mock-up models to the prototypes and manufacturing is the innovation cycle which is very critical. Design school at IDC, IIT Bombay was known for making mock-up models and good designs but we could never translate them into real life products and the design innovation center project gave us this opportunity to move from concepts to the market in a very big way. So I will like to now take you around the studio to explain what all we're doing. We've been working uh, uh, on various projects ranging from post boxes to helmets to uh, water bottles for CRPF Jawans. I'll take you along and first introduce you to my project manager. This is Prakash who's been with us for nearly 15 years now and he handles all the project management uh, as well as the project accounting. Uh, 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 we have senior designers uh, both uh, uh, like uh, Abhinash and Chari, both of them have nearly uh, eight to nine years of experience uh, in the field. Uh, uh, Chari is working on one conventional project ranging from uh, uh, prosthesis to helmets. Uh, Avinash has been doing this uh, work uh, which is his student project when he was in IDC here. We've been working on a solar oven which will be actually put up in the uh, houses like a window air conditioner and you can actually have the convenience of uh, uh, cooking from inside the house on the solar oven. We have uh, Aniket who is the uh, head of our prototyping. Uh, he's been working on uh, this uh, bottle for uh, CRPF Javans. We'll show you some of the mock-ups in the mock-up area. Uh, I have Ashish uh, who is been working on the uh, helmets for CRPF as well as the helmet. For riot police, uh, the, we, you can see a lot of uh, uh, 3D printed models and uh, design details there. Uh, the, we have our engineers uh, like Ashwati who has been working on filtration technology, looking at arsenic filters for Balia uh, at uh, Varanasi and uh, a team of two people are already in Balia uh, uh, testing our domestic uh, arsenic filter over there. Uh, we have the project on a dental chair uh, where Arun's uh, chair has uh, won the uh, uh, award for the Dubai uh, Design Fest where this dental chair which is a portable dental chair we go to take uh, to Dubai for display. We have various facilities in the innovation studio ranging from the tinkering table where we assemble uh, you know, the mock-up models, assemble the working prototypes. This is uh, Nishit, my student, who has been uh, also got the Global uh, uh, Dubai Degree Show Award. So his model, which is a lamp for children for study purposes, also won the uh, award and uh, he's going to Dubai to exhibit the same place. Uh, I'd like to now show you the very frugal, simple uh, 3D printing facilities. You can see one of the ladies helmet design which one of us are working on the prototype so you know that is uh, like i thought i just stop over there with the introduction to the studio and uh, i have another uh, three minutes so i thought i'll just uh, show you a little bit of uh, the project a little bit detail of one project in two minutes uh, which is what also vishal had specifically mentioned so we you know like so i've been teaching my btech students i just finished a class with our first year btechs where we tried to take them through the design thinking process and to the everlasting credit of our students they said so we need a formula for design so we came up with the seven concerns of innovation most of them are there on the on my YouTube channel, so I will you know show you the link. Uh, but I'm going to show you only the first one, which is uh, we designed uh, this uh, wonderful uh, wing tracer, uh, and it's all about standing up for a cause. It's 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 all concerned with human emotions, and you know it's concerned with your you know st uh, your design uh, thinking and how you you know imbibe all those qualities uh, to take up you know like uh, to take up these things uh, to the market.
So here, uh, quickly, I'll show you uh, the slides uh, where we are looking at, uh, you know, how this simple wean tracer would reduce the drudgery uh, of, uh, uh, you know, like uh, the pain and uh, multiple, you know, pricks of a person. And uh, like, you know, the student went uh, to blood banks to uh, do various activities, and then, you know, like uh, understand he himself started giving, you know blood to know what happens, you know, uh, empathy is the core value and of course come up with multiple ideas. I'm not going to share that because it's already there on the channel. Anybody interested can see the total process. Uh, we've actually captured the whole journey uh, in our uh, sort of and then here comes the interesting thing after the student project. You take it up with industry. You take the the, the you you bring in new teams of people who are experienced with uh, electronics or experienced with wonderful battery technologies and optics to take this product to the market. And there comes in the project funding to you know to be used to bring it to market. And you know we did the pilot production with industrial you know like uh, uh, development. And you know I'm not going to play the video again. And then you know like uh, uh, we we then took it to the market. So like here for example this particular bean tracer uh, did so well that even the president's office now has a bean tracer and now it's been you know technology transferred uh, to a company uh, in Mumbai and then they are taking it forward to make it available uh, for the public at large. Uh, thank you so much that's my 10 minutes uh, thanks Vishal. Okay, uh, we'll come back, as I said, uh, uh, to the questions uh, all at one. So with that, we'll come to our uh, next speaker. So I'll uh, invite uh, Mr. Milind Kotekar. Uh, he graduated from IIT Bombay. He's the chief of staff and head of products at Aether. Milind works on both the long-term technology roadmap for Aether, as well as the day-to-day -day aspects of creating a top-notch engineering team and culture. He brings over 12 plus years of experience in engineering and leadership, his experience in working on diverse complex problem statements along with his context of the organization internally makes him well poised to lead the organization in the growth phase. Uh, his motto in life, uh, striving to add value to this world to the development of great products and next generation technologies. So all yours, just give me a moment to yeah. get your slides up. Have a seat. I think um, this 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 fine. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Milin. I have been. Um, I'm, I'm an engineer by uh, uh, by education, right? And I've been with Aether for about um, about eight years now. Um, before that, I was uh, working at a company called Eaton Technologies. And um, products has building products has always been my passion, and one of the things that led me to Aether. Um, and at Aether, I have I actually joined as an engineer. Um, became um, became product manager uh, and over time I've sort of gone on to lead this team of uh, a bunch of product managers trying to um, trying to build the next generation of products at ETH, right? Um, and I'm actually not here to talk about design. I think enough people can um, tell you that from um, academia, from uh, from a lot of lot of books, right? Uh, a lot of stories that you don't hear is is what it takes for design to to make it right to to truly make it to market. Uh, in in my mind, um, joy of designing, joy of building, joy of engineering. Right. Uh, one of the reasons that I that I quit my previous company, right, was um, and and some of you may relate to this as you go ahead, or maybe you have already related to this, is. Uh, uh, I was engineering a lot of cool things. I was working on wireless charging. I was working on uh, smart fuses. I was working on a lot of things, a lot of tech that never saw the light of the day, right? Uh, it was there, nice research projects, winning a bunch of awards, a uh, bunch of papers published. Nothing really made it. Nothing that I could tell my family that, hey, 
why don't you try this uh it's beautiful i like like you'll love it right um and when ether came along uh that's the opportunity that that sort of moved me to it right um and and the piece that i want to talk to you guys about today is um is why do concept cars and concept motorcycles look like this whereas the reality of it um in the end becomes this right and and you can um, you can actually keep looking at uh, different examples right of of cool concept cars right absolutely cool you would you would love to buy that in life and then when when it comes actually to life uh you get something which is extremely traditional extremely conformist uh like a 10% variation from from what uh what what exists in the market right and at ather one of the things that i have been extremely proud of and a lot of folks at ather are extremely proud of was the concept that we built and this concept is from uh this is the concept that we showcased uh in 2016 at uh the on the left right and the product that we made, went to market with right um and the product that we went to went to market with was about it took about two and a half years and if you look at the journey of the concept itself right from where it was in 2013 to where it reached in 2016 um you will you will see it being very similar right um so and and if you look at ether today you will you will find it very similar um still right so so what were what were people at ether doing if design has not changed from 2013 to 2023 right uh where we were we were fighting to keep this design alive right and and that uh that is the fight that if if you truly want uh want that joy that i i just talked about where where you are where you've built a vehicle that your family can ride and and you can say hey this this is the design that i built that's the ride that uh that you need to be uh willing to willing to be a part of right and uh one of the one of the departments that has seen like the least attrition for example at ether right has been the design department um and and that's that's one of those things that that it requires that that somebody who has that belief to to stay and to to sort of stick around to to make something a reality right now uh now what does it take right what does it take to um to hold on to design first um it takes immense amount of empathy uh and this is not consumer empathy right consumer empathy i think you've been taught at at college uh, in design schools uh how to understand the consumer how to understand uh, the market how to understand their behaviors you need immense amount of empathy towards your stakeholders uh you need to solve their problems if you want them to to this design you you can't say hey i've i've designed this uh take it why don't you take this to production right hey manufacturing guys why don't you take this to production hey uh, engineers why don't you design something around by the way when this was being designed i was an engineer who who had to fit like like a charger that that was supposed to be this big in a in a form factor uh that and 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 i was i was told that hey this this is what the design is going to be you figure out where you want to put the charger right and um we had to we had to split the charger into two pieces uh one was around uh this area other was somewhere around this area and if you look at uh if you look at the charger from generation 1 which went on to the vehicle it uh, one part of it will look like an aeroplane other part of it will look like a spaceship um and and nobody had split chargers inside a vehicle but that that's that's what it took because we were design first company right and um and that design first was not an autocratic mentality it was it was everyone ev- each and every one of designers uh, and folks from product were uh, were extremely passionate about op- about what they wanted to build how they wanted to change the industry right and i was on the other side um 
and and that passion was infectious that that passion uh, made me put in extra hours so that they can hold on to the design that 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 they believed in right that they believed will change the industry um and and that's and and once uh, actually the design was very close to production about 6 months away from production um uh, we manufactured the first uh, first product out of uh, out of our first factory right it took 2 days to build a product right it took two full days for us to put all of our subsystems together and it still like still things did not fit our first 30 vehicles were like rolls royce level handcrafted um, because there was no other way to build it none of them were mass production ready uh, and at which point the designers were not sitting there changing designs to uh make the manufacturable the designs designers were actually coming and and figuring out what were the problems with manufacturing uh and how can they help solve it right um uh, you you have to be there there was a um there was a small group that was created to solve more than 1000 problems uh 6 months away from production uh that we had in the factory because the vehicle was not coming together right you had warpage issues you had uh uh you had uh, color matching issues color correction like everything that can go wrong will go wrong right you will have thousand reasons to give up and say no 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 i am just a designer uh let me go back and let me design four more concepts or you can go in there and you can fight right uh and in in my mind um designers at ether um had a bunch of people right and a bunch of people at ether actually uh decided to fight and and bring it to production right um the the other thing that it takes um is it's significant amount of I'm, i'm not sure how much time to have um so just give me a second right um the uh one other way that uh that that you need to um once once you solve people's problems right um you have to make people care about design right that's the that's the job that i am personally currently in right now um it's it's very easy for designers to for example say hey you don't get it right this is design this is this is none of your business right uh, you don't get to judge design uh, and and like i've heard this from i think every designer that i've met right as people just don't get design like consumers just don't get design right and um what you have to realize is not everyone can judge engineering not everyone can judge manufacturing not everyone can judge physics right but everyone is allowed to judge design and that's something that you will you will have to get used to right uh, and you will have to um it it will just have to be a part of that journey for you where um you will have to understand what people what everyone is feeling about your design right uh whether to care for it or not is is your choice whether to change design or not is your choice but uh to say don't have opinions is a like don't do that b fight to change those opinions right make people care and and that starts not with customers customers you like um uh, as as you saw in the behavioral uh, science presentation right customers will make those decisions in a heartbeat a lot of purchases uh, are also not rational they are extremely emotional so customers will make those split second decisions about your product but stakeholders right people who are sitting with their mbas trying to run the company you will realize those are people who who sort of um ensure that those concepts that you saw don't turn into a reality right and you have to you have to be you have to learn to fight those forces how do you fight right um and and this is the this is the uh line that i that i say to most people right um great products are 
built and destroyed not in design studios they are built and destroyed in corridors of an organization right uh, the conversations that happen in a corridor uh, and and you need to be able to get into those corridors build the right relationships uh, if you are not able to fight right uh, learn to find somebody who can and learn to find somebody and 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 make them fall in love with the product make them fight uh because because anyone who has to compromise for this they need to do that willingly they need to and and that if you can get somebody to fall in love with the product to that extent that that they are willing to say oh i will i will work these three extra nights so that you can just chill and not change your line right um that is when you have done your job as a designer right so that's and it's it's much easier said than done uh but but that's why you will you will see either uh, a lot of frustrated designers who will continuously say ah nobody cares no you have to you have to make people care right um and and finally um in in my mind you have to you have to stick with it right you have to stick with it till again i'll i'll reiterate right the joy of it does not come out of just like building a concept right like a like a 7 year old can create like a great drawing uh, a 13 year old can create like a great concept spaceship right um and you you guys will realize at some point of time uh that that is not giving you any kick right building newer and your concepts is not giving you that kick what is giving you that kick is it's seeing somebody that you you love you respect uh sort of sitting on your creation using your creation and giving you that feedback that oh this is lovely right i i i want to uh this this is uh uh like yeah this made my day right and one of the things is not just making these products uh beautiful or functional right uh one of the last things is actually making these products scale uh making these products into great businesses right uh because that that joy truly multiplies at at scale right when when 10 people tell you that oh they loved your product versus a thousand people tell you versus a million people who love iPhones right um the the fight that you that it takes to sort of hold that design and take it to production and then then chisel costs uh make it um, make it production worthy right um, uh, the the two day um, two days that it took to manufacture uh, today ether churns out about like ether has capacity to churn out 1200 vehicles uh, in a day out of out of a production line right uh, a lot of designers played yeah, their yeah. Uh, played their their part in that right uh from where ether started in terms of its cost structures right uh, which were extremely expensive um where ether is today we've reduced cost by more than 70% right uh design played a lot of like like a large part in that as well right uh, and and all of this together gives you that 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 chance right uh that that somebody sitting somewhere in bilaspur uh, is is riding your scooter and going we and and then saying oh like this 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 is the future right um and and yeah I, if if i have to give you one advice just like uh get out of your desks and learn to fight right that's that would be my few cents on design i think yeah thank you thank you very much so the concept to reality uh, is the struggle the face for the entire two years here uh two years is not enough to realize it but good to hear from somebody practicing and telling it uh, their way all right so with this i'll invite uh, mr hiramat mr arya siramat he is an experienced innovator with 36 years of experience in designing products to empower the poorest populations around the world with over 600 innovations to his credit Uh, and out of which 270 have been commercialized uh, uh his work is aimed at providing affordable solutions to those at the bottom of the human pyramid his products have uh, impacted the lives of millions of people particularly the elderly and farming communities uh, not written here but uh, he is the md and ceo of flexitron yeah. 
Uh, and if you go to the site, you'll see how many awards he's won uh, with uh, numerous presidents and others. So uh, I'll just uh, open the slides. Just give me a moment. Yeah, good evening to you all. Well, uh, from a journey of a five star, you know, high tech recipes and everything, I bring you now down to a darshani on the street. I am going to talk to you about my experience of design, offering products, innovation. From the last 36 years, I took a long break of about uh, 10 to 12 years in between, and I'm back into the field again. So this experience, you can say, is minus 12 years, and the new, the latest new product we'll discuss sometime later when we have time. So, yeah, that's about me. Now that 600 plus innovations have gone to 6. Uh, uh, 36, 36 as of yesterday, and 275 innovations now, 310 being commercialized. Uh, patents have abandoned. I see no meaning in them because the kind of designs and innovations I and my team keep churning out is virtually one or two a month. And uh, with 130 countries as a base for my products and users, there is no time to even make documentation. We have a different team for that. I will come in the end and explain to you how do you manage such a gorgonton thing with just three people. I have only three people in my office, including me. And a small office, it is run very frugally, lean managed, and we have a fantastic network. Next slide, please. So this was my basic idea. Well, uh, to give you a small background of mine, I was working in the Indian Institute of Science, along with KSCST. I worked with Dr. Jay Srinivasan and uh, several other professors. Uh, maybe about 16 months, after which uh, there was a talk by a Japanese uh, professor here who was talking on solar cells. So I told him something about the solar cells and what could be done with that. He gave me a check of 500 US dollars. He said, don't stay in this place. Get out of this place. Well, uh, I'm coming back here again today talking to you people. Not that there was anything bad, but what he said was that technology was such a path breaking one and that was the one which gave me immense capital in the beginning in the early 90s when there was nothing called venture capital no venture capitalist i couldn't walk into a bank and get a order of 500 rupees money was very very scarce and it just came in uh, that's uh, that's the power of design that's the power of innovation next slide please this is the basic map most of you must have seen and you must have heard uh, Mr. C.K. Prahlad, who is the, known as the marketing guru, and Venkat Raman. All the three of us would have hours of argument on this. He thought the bottom was for exploitation. I said the bottom is for offering products. We just see the paradox. The top red is where all your iPhones, phones, cars, everything fits in. In the bottom, they have nothing. I've had an iPhone for the rural population of the world. Or maybe a computer, maybe a tab, some product which you can say a farmer needs it and this goes to the farmer or to the people in the bottom of the pyramid. No. We always think we need to make products or design products for people who are in the elite top. Unfortunately, the war there is something very different. You blow away so much of money on redesigning the same thing, inventing the wheel all over again, like an iPhone being continuously added up with just some kind of a delta addition to it. Maybe a bit of longer zoom or a longer thing. All you're making is call talk. Why spend $26 billion for one phone to come out? Imagine the bottom. What could you do? You could do magic there. This formula I got in 87, and that's when I thought this is the market and this is where it should be hit. And there was no looking back for me till late. Next, please. I'll just take you through some very abstract case studies. Like this is from uh, Nagpur. I had the police commissioner, a good friend of mine, Mr. Govind. He called me in, so around 10 o'clock. He said, if you're free, please fly down tomorrow. We have a typical problem. We have about 17 rickshaw pullers who have become decoits. Well, I said, this is interesting, and uh, if your office is, listen, your office is listening, this is something interesting for you to know the behavior uh, uh, methods of the rickshaw pullers. After I went to Nagpur, we sat down. I said, I need a meeting if you, if you want some issue to be sorted out, since they thought 
as a social innovator, we could do something. We had a meeting, it was very interesting. And the rickshaw guys told me, sir, because of the traffic issues, we were slowing down the traffic, we are thrown out of the roads, we are banned rickshaws, we don't know anything else to do except decorate in the night. That's it. Either you place us in a government job or give us an alternative. That's when this was designed. I made a static cycle where they do the pedaling at home. During that, they charge the batteries. They put their power into small little uh, battery boxes. Next slide. They take it to the market, lend it. This is a terrific model, and they have got their own internal circle, their own lending, their own method. They make the product themselves. They lend it. It's a phenomenal economy that's running on its own, and it's all over. It has reached Bangladesh. It has reached you know, parts of Myanmar and somewhere into Rajasthan. I don't know where. I have not done the mapping. It's going to take me days if I start mapping where my products are. So this is where the connect between humans' requirement, the need, and of course, a lot of thinking went into the type of battery, what has to go, the LED, and the kind of brightness it should get, the power it needs to be stored, and how much of storage is to be done in that little box. Finally, is it affordable? And then the durability of the product. There's no hit and miss here. An urban buyer has a lot of mercy, but a rural buyer is merciless. He doesn't like your product, he murders you along with the product. In the sense, nobody enters the market there. So it's a different, completely thing. It, we may think it's a white good, no label, there's no trademark, there's no advertisement required, but be aware, you are walking on a razor's edge when you enter into the rural market. The product is good, you can sleep, they will do the advertisement. Next one. Then this is a very simple telephone charger. It got evolved when I was in Kalari Desert, Africa. So me and my friend, we were both sitting, uh, and she said suddenly, tomorrow morning, Mr. Hiramat, we have no meetings. We are not meeting the tribes here. I said, why? The whole lot of them have gone to charge their phones. I said, what do you mean the whole lot? 32 of them and all of them. Yes, each one is carrying about 100 phones. The business model was they would go to village, bring phones, take it to the next village, charge it, bring it back, and distribute it back for a fee. And then communication was alive for a couple of days. And I said, yes, fine, we could do something like this. And we made a small standalone solar charger, gave it to an entrepreneur. He would charge them, you know, equivalent of 10 rupees. You eat some food. By the time you come back, the phone is charged. Huge technology went into it because the phones they were using were Chinese make. And Chinese batteries are notorious for starting firecracker works. They, they work like, you know, at the odd time, they burst into the oddest places. So we needed to keep it in a very safe charging method. Cooling was done. I studied on batteries, and uh, thanks to my network of people, they gave me inputs, and this has become a hit. They build it. They take some components from me, but most of it is self-made. And about maybe Africa, we have closed about 130,000 of these working, from schools to where, I don't know. And they have made their own contraption. Somebody has got it in a briefcase. Somebody has put the solar panels on a donkey. He puts this thing there, he connects it. Those photographs are innumerable. I will show them once if I get an opportunity sometime later, OK? Yeah. This is one more product. Why I put the SDG things on the right side? UN tagged this for me. Because they said, way back when SDG was not even a concept born, we already had products which were following the SDG. They were following certain things, like, for example, uh, the one is clean energy, second is health for all, and then the third thing is, you know, I can't read that. What is that? <laughs> yeah, uh, climate change also. Now, this was the product where the Japanese guy asked me to get out of here. Reason was, this was designed way back in 87. Solar cells were in their infancy, and only Australia had the technology to make smaller pieces of solar cells. You could grow them as a round crystal. Standard size was 100 mm. Anything smaller was very difficult to cut it because solar cell would shatter. It's like glass, very fragile. Then they used diamond saws to cut it, and the saw was expensive. Finally, each cut would be costing about six rupees, approximately, Indian six rupees. One Australian company had the monopoly on it. We would make odd size cells, and everybody was amazed. Oh, this can be used for now some product other than a big solar panel. There was a seasoned crystal growing technique book, which I got from a Russian. 
when I studied that, I came to know how the crystallography of a solar cell is. I found a technique of slicing the cells for two pesa from five rupees. We had loads of Chinese who would come with bags of solar cells, sit in our unit, get them cut, take it away. Early solar toys from China, most of them I'm very proud to say, were cut at my unit in Bangalore. In a very small setup. Now this is the power of innovation to uh, <coughs> come to the bottom of the product, chuck it, and from there on came this very unique product because uh, hearing aids that were being distributed by government of India to the poorest of the hearing aid users or the people who are deaf were being thrown away after a month and a half. So WHO made a very quiet study. Let's check what's happening to our money in India. So they came here and uh, checked with across the, all the villages in a particular method. The survey said 98% abandoned. And they called the health secretary and said, uh, well, gentlemen, next year we are not going to support your program for uh, distributing aids to handicap because this is a serious issue. Then they came to IASC. Dr. Jay Srinivasan was contacted. Dr. Jay Srinivasan said, there is one mad guy with me. Maybe he can think about it. So they caught me and they said, and I asked uh, the joint secretary, how big is the fire and uh, how close are you to it? He said, it's in my bloody room today. I need a solution. Then I gave him a prototype in a week. UNESCO accepted it. And this became the hottest product. Even till today, I call it my star product because there are about close to 37 million users of this product. And this has the biggest and fantastic story about a circular economy, if you want to talk, from waste to a product which is useful. The reason how it came about, I'll just show you. This is a satellite. Why I'm connecting you to a very uh, grassroots product to the satellite is, ISRO would make solar panels for their satellites. BHL was supplying the solar panels. And the rejection ratio of the solar panel was 9 out of 10. So nine panels were rejected, in the sense at the cell stage. And BHL still had, did not have the kind of waste disposal. Uh, the horror stories were not there yet. But they knew that one day it will come, and they had just dumped this. I met Kasturi Rangan once on a flight, so I was going, and I just told him, sir, I'm making something like this, and would you access me the solar cells which are rejected from this space-grade cells? He said, I'm great, I'll give you a letter, go to BHL tomorrow. And I went to BHL, and BHL took me, and they said, here are the cells. The waste cells were put up like a mountain in open air. He said, you pick up what you like. And for me, I was like a kid, you know, I was, I was just seeing one big mountain of laddus, and I could take what I want. And then we bought a truck, we brought out, that went on. And later, we made the product so cheap, World Bank called for, sorry, WHO called for a global tender, we were the lowest and nearest competitor was 6X. He was a Chinese guy. Now there again, you could call it a bit of luck or a bit of uh, thinking, but things fell into place linearly. And we brought about a product which, you know, has got millions and millions of users who the forest population who use it. So that's where the power lies in seeing how you can take your thinking to the grassroots also. Next one. You know, these are the cut cells which we sliced. And this is my last product I'll be talking about. How many minutes are over? Uh, okay. That is the Charaka Khadi, rather a symbolic uh, cloth of uh, India. And why I'm very proud about Khadi is, if we have a nuke war, which there's a possibility, the whole world will go naked because there'll be nothing to wear for them, except India. Because we know how to make clothes out of cotton without a machine through that thing. So just remember it. The thinking what is there of Kadi is so powerful. I mean, it's not only just symbolic. It is also something where from a bush to your shirt, everything is in-house with a very small rudimentary machines. This was dying. And uh, Dr. Kumud Ben Joshi, who was the governor of uh, Andhra Pradesh, later became the KVIC <coughs> chairman, she approached me and said, can we revive this? Because uh, earning that's being done by this charaka is very poor. People earn about 30 to 40 rupees a day. They keep spitting. I don't know how many of you have seen uh, charaka being spun. Any of you here in the audience who has seen a charaka? 
well fine it's a old history yeah great and uh, that apart what happened was uh, 40 rupees a day was not a very attractive income but still some people did it then i said we'll add another element to that make it little more attractive we will make it generate electricity because most people who were using this had no electricity at homes they were using kerosene lamps and the lights of that so we'll make it generate electricity and let it give some light in the night they will be attracted to the light more than the khadi so they will definitely start using it and this what has happened and gujarat one year there was a glut of khadi because too much of khadi was produced later it got stabilized and then there are different mechanisms which are able to absorb it one particular trick here the design what came was the generator what you can see on the left side it's a very complex generator i designed it for about 25 to 30 years of life i have sold more generators than the charka itself but there was a huge demand people used it in various applications then came the lighting unit you cannot add a load to it to the charka by saying that well i'll use some extra effort because they will stop using it so you need to add just that micro delta bit with that you must store the electricity and also use it very efficiently that's when nishia company led company came into uh the equation i knew they had a r&d led which was producing excellent light about 120 lumens per watt I approached them and uh, they said no we cannot give it this is an alpha sample stage but after they knew what it was they said fine we are proud to give you 10000 units free of cost they supported me up to 100000 units free of cost later it was in the market things happened well this is a very brief story about uh, three of my odd products which i could just pick up and bring and talk to you we will take questions a little later thank you so much wonderful day is this working it's right okay okay so all right so with that um, four wonderful talks uh, i mean that's the that's what we hope in these talks very diverse uh, sort of backgrounds uh, still a lot of synergy in what they talk about so with that uh, we'll move to the next part of the session which is to go to the uh, panel discussion and after the panel discussion we'll come back uh, and so I'll take a few questions to begin with, and then I'll uh, open the floor for everyone to ask where you can ask the questions that based on the talks as well. Uh, and as I said, part of the reason I want to keep this uh, is to keep consistent questions across the different events, so that we get the book out that we would like to. Right. So uh, if uh, I think uh, Junofi and Prasad Chakravarti, if you can sort of also please uh, come online, share your cameras, I uh, will get the Q and A started. Come on, we have some water. Oh yes. Can we get some water? <laughs> no, no, absolutely. Absolutely, it should have been here, anyways. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll start with the first question. Uh, we'll go with again uh, in random orders, but we'll start with the online speakers first. So, uh, of course, Junofi said she's more from behavioral sciences, but then uh, a lot of overlap with uh, behavioral sciences and design. So. Uh, from your sort of point of view as a behavioral scientist uh, what do you think design is and uh, so how do you see it uh, what are the key features of design or salient features that you think are important uh, for uh, somebody graduating out of design program to consider so you know if this is for you i hope she has not dropped out she was here some time She's dropped out. Okay, so Professor Chakravarti, if you can take that question. Okay, you have to unmute yourself. So the Vishal, I think you know, from a design point of view, all we can all meet. The biggest challenge uh, for us is that we have to bring in that empathy, which uh, you know, like Kirimet also was mentioning, uh, of having actual, you know, really concerned users in our midst. so today for example we are so fortunate to have a campus uh, in uh, uh, life in iit so uh, you know if i did a product for the elderly 
I have took all my students, all the 30 students, to elderly homes on the campus staff community. And then they, when they saw in real the concerns and the problems uh, of the elderly, you know, then we could start, you know, working. So it's, there's no chance that we can, uh, you know, have uh, fictitious empathies. We have to really, you know, start with empathy and the concern, uh, which is the most important critical learning in design. Right. Thank you. Uh, I think we can share these, Mike. So we'll start with uh, you. So what does design or designing mean to you? And, uh, you know, same question. And, uh, you know, what, what do you see is as salient features? No, it, it, it uh, my bottom line, one thing is uh, a consumer is not a fool, he's a wife. He's uh, old damn ugly method, I said that once very, very famously, which means that uh, design would definitely mean we offer a product which, you know, satisfies the needs both end, the functionality and um, feeling proud to hold it, plus uh, it should be durable, worth its money and you need to think on several angles of that. Yeah. Similar, same question. Um, fairly <laughs> hard to give like a short answer to it. Um, for me, um, design is um, is is a way of solving problems, uh, and and design is not um, not a not just limited to products, like not just limited to physical products. Now it's very easy to imagine with like digital products, right? That design translates there. Uh, but even services, right? Everywhere, um, like like there's an entire branch of design called designing of cues, right? Which is what is the what is the right way to design, uh, like right way to make people wait, right? Uh, so for me, design is is about um, is about finding those problems, um, putting your design thinking hat, whatever uh, that that means, right? Um, and and just and just solving that problem, and it and it 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 goes across uh, streams. It goes across. Uh, there's engineering design, there is uh, manufacturing design, there, there's, there is design as an element um, like everywhere that you look, right? Uh, so only design just boils down to solving uh, problems in a, in a certain way, right? In, an, in a very empathetic way, um, in a way that you don't have to solve it again uh, in, uh, in some sense, yeah. Right, thank you. So, Jinofi, the question goes back to you. So, from your behavioral science hat, uh, how do you see design and what does it mean to be designing? All right, so, uh, I didn't hear the first part of that talk. I mean, the, the answer you just said, but it sort of seems like you did cover everything I would want to say. So, yeah, it, I do see it as of course, like solving a problem, but also solving a problem in a way that it is sustainable and, and with a lot of user obsessed thinking as well, which again, as much as we talk about, I constantly feel like it's something that needs to be spoken about a lot more because I know as all of you uh, having worked in this area, you you'll probably constantly feel that, that things are lacking as well, right? Like when you use an app, when you're walking around the way a restaurant is designed, the way the streets are designed, there's loads of areas where you constantly feel like, did the person even think about the user? So I think that is what I would say designing behaviorally would mean to me. Right, so a follow-up question comes, which again, I'll go through the panel. Uh, what does it mean to be a designer? Again, uh, so one is the designer, what they think of themselves, but there's a society who thinks what a designer is. Right, and this is important again for somebody who's graduating with a degree in design and is sort of designated as a designer. So how do they manage this expectation of the society as what a designer is and versus what they have learned as what design is? So you know, if we start from you. Oh, again, me, okay, cool, cool. Um, can someone else go first? I wanna collect <laughs> my thoughts first. <laughs> All right, so Professor Chakravarti. Yeah. So in fact, uh, again, it's a very, very, you know, uh, interesting, simple question though. Uh, 
in fact uh, you know like uh, uh, you know as you uh, you know as you go uh, from from expectations point of view i was interviewing some 200 uh, kids yesterday and one guy came and told me i watched asli aditi on youtube and that's how i come for the interview to come to idc and i said my god who is this asli aditi then i went to youtube and checked up who she was and there she was she was talking about design and she was saying what should designers do and then you know like and then in such simple terms without any sort of ambiguity and then she's of course she said she's a product designer but you know but then we, we need to like what you know we all were saying we need to solve problems and then when we are designers we we have to have the attitude and the uh, and the capability uh, to solve you know all types of problems and issues which a company faces the kiramat was saying you know it could be a technology issue it could be a user centered issue and we should be able to work collaboratively across domains to come up and solve problems so we can't say it's not our problem or it's not our situation the designer amalgamates everything so when we are there in the company the designer actually is uh, is the person who, who will be the go to person and in you know from all my experiences i have seen that you know we are the ones who can embrace every problem uh, which needs to be solved in the industry or you know always right. thank you so you know if you have you gathered your thoughts yes i can speak now <laughs> So I was just trying to think of the designers that I know and what do I go to them for and often it's it's something very nice so <laughs> I usually have these thoughts in my head of like okay so this is how the user would feel at this specific point in time and this is how we want them to feel and these are the various way you can these are the various heuristics and biases behavioral science principles all of these concepts that you can use to do that and this is all the load that I have can you do something with it and, and there's this amazing person who just does some magic and comes up with something amazing which is a combination of lots of imagination and also lots of skill and i think that is in a designer sort of like an artist with who plays around with tools lots of sometimes restrictions and yeah constraints but i see that as a a person who has a lot of imagination thank you milan same question um again uh, very simplistically again sticking to my earlier point designer is a problem solver but um, i think i want to talk about what uh, junofi talked about in her presentation right which is from a societal perspective what a designer is and um, if you read this book called i think predictably irrational talks talks about it there's a book called hooked uh, which uh, where this line between what is forget ethical right is it legal to do these things right uh, if uh, if cigarettes are illegal then why is let's say tiktok legal right um and yeah you can say okay yeah put a 13 like put a 13 year old cap there like uh, uh, as, as as an age age cap right but um as a uh, from society perspective right uh, it's it's going to be harder and harder to sort of in this very capitalist society uh, to remain an ethical designer uh, and and if you can if you can hold on to that right i think you are doing society uh, more of a service and i've i've thought quite a lot about it actually if you can build design products right which get you um maybe out of these addictive situations or uh, even better get you addicted to the right things because it's it's become uh, i think you know we can agree with this right it's become fairly easy to get people addicted to things uh, uh, emotionally right like it just you will not realize why you spent 2 hours on youtube or tiktok or instagram but it it just it just becomes so easy so uh, can you channel that in the right direction uh, and that would be for me uh, like a societal uh, value of a of a designer today well for me <clears throat> if i look at the way companies think and the way designers think 
there are two very interesting parts. One is creating wealth by making a new design, offering a new design which is going to beat the competition out in the market, and I offer it. And I thrust it so forcibly down the throat of the user, whether he likes it or not, they buy it. That's where a lot of money gets created. Second part of the design part is, where I genuinely have noticed a problem, I know that the money may not be very big, but the satisfaction can be, and I offer a product there. So these two distinct elements of designs are there. And my experience with uh, Hong Kong Trade Development Corporation, HKTDC, which I had an association for close to 22 years with them, uh, for uh, each of their uh, product cycles, the, the best of the Chinese companies, and uh, we were all sitting on a round table, and it was a marathon session, some sessions running close to 27 hours at a stretch sometimes. We would have such kind of brainstorming to bring about products and design products which is going to be offered to the whole globe very clearly divided into three sectors. One sector is the impulsive purchase sector. Second was the compulsive purchase where they will need. The third was very cautiously they approached into the white goods or the durables. Until I left HKTDC, they never ever ventured into the third section. One and two was what they attacked. They built an ecosystem and the designers were continuously kept busy for this. You buy a goods, a Chinese product, you feel happy, your dopamine is released, you possess it, use it. After the quota of dopamine is over, it can no longer release it. You throw it without any regret. That's one sector of designers, which are now continuously coming out into the market. And the second set is, of course, something which is compulsory, where I made kitchen utensils, I made uh, products for my housewife, uh, products for, you know, everything which uh, we would talk about at the HKTDC, uh, Hong Kong State Development Corporation, where all the Chinese guys would gather, they always came out with a product which had no responsibility. It only satiated your demand in the sense, I possess it, I have my dopamine release, but the product is not responsible for any of its functionality in full. You should not regret losing it or regret if the thing goes kaput or bad. That's a completely different class of design, which of course I was used for, but I would say that still, we as designers have a responsibility to the society. You identify a problem, you see a problem, which you must definitely have the sixth sense for it, and you know that you have a solution, please do offer it, and take it ahead. It's a part of your social service. I would not say completely moral, but fine, do it, go ahead. Right, so the next question, I'll combine the next two together. Okay. So, so you have now 36 years of experience and of course everyone on this panel is very experienced. So uh, how has your sort of understanding of design evolved over the years when you started as a designer versus now where you are? And if you can also point out to specific events or uh, projects or things that changed your perspective significantly. Well, uh, my very early years where I could travel the world, I saw the world with uh, you know, uh, three different sections, the communists of China, the Eastern Bloc, Poland to all this to Russia, and then the Western Bloc where the, as we call it, the developed Bloc. All these three blocks think design in a very different factor. And uh, the Western Bloc where we have the developed countries, we have one separate section called the Germans. Germans thought a product made has to last for 200 years, or 300 years, for its eternity rather. And uh, US guys, Americans, they were very fond of weapons because weapons is something which brought them very easy money. So they concentrated their completing on this. And the Eastern Bloc, Russia, their idea was absolute functionality. They, are, they were not at all bothered and still not bothered about aesthetics or anything. They said it must function and it must function under the worst kind of situations. And here comes the most interesting block, that is the communist bloc where they have two different sectors. One is strength in manufacturing, strength in thinking, and strength in understanding the world market. And these guys really made the money. These guys made a presence, and the Eastern Bloc made products for themselves. So this is the kind of diverse design sector which I saw, and uh, all three have their advantages. Lind, same question. So your understanding of design, how has it evolved over the years? And any specific influence? Um, so I think uh, earlier I um, 
when it came to for example phones right i was a very um xiaomi sort of a guy uh where i'm like hey phones are for calling right and for maybe messaging um and and that's it like uh, nokia did the job uh, and now in this touch screen world um xiaomi uh, does it like at whatever 4000 like there was until i think 3 and a half 4 years back um I, like that was one purchase for me which was extremely functional um and then i enter like but i but i used to follow um the world of apple right and i i was generally just like m- always mind blown by what what they were putting out there um and uh, and the f- uh, i i used to tell my friends uh, hey like uh, there came a point where i'm like okay i can afford an iphone but i probably can't afford to break an iphone so i'll not buy an iphone yet right and there came a point where i'm like okay i i can break an iphone probably and not be very sad about it so i bought like the iphone and then once i bought it uh i that that entire ecosystem sucked me in right and there are these very subtle hooks built in that ecosystem uh what he called like five star products right uh they just like until you get all of it you you're not happy right um like you actually my first product was not an iphone it was an ipad which was like which was extremely uh, like if if you want like one product from apple which is extremely value for money there's nothing better than like an ipad which was like some 25000 rupees back then. um and then you get an iphone but then uh, there are these airpods that work very well and then you get the watch and then it just and and everything just adds this extremely high utility over the next product till the ecosystem suddenly becomes uh like extremely rich and now they're uh, now they're getting into this digital side of ecosystem which is um uh, which is icloud right um, and and the way it works extremely seamlessly uh, across all of your devices and and just like the magical moment for me was uh i was wearing my airpods um and i um I was watching a movie on um um on ipad and then a call came and i just picked up my phone and the airpods just shifted to it right and that level of integration right just it just blew me away like um and and you've seen it you've you've seen it in videos you've seen all of it but when you experience it uh you you never go back right uh and that's been my uh like like if if i have to build uh products that's that's the way that i think of products and services now how well do they work together how how seamlessly do different parts um of of your offering as a company uh interact with each other right uh and and i'm a huge fan of ecosystems now um and and they do add value um so yeah that's wonderful so sophie same question sure so i was just trying to remember the first time i thought something close to design and um it was when i was much when i was really young i used to play two different games and one game the, the this was times when you used to play games on the tv and not the cool kind of games these were like these just black and white games uh with this four buttons that you click and play anyway so there was this one game which i liked a lot but i wouldn't play too much of but there was this other game which i didn't like too much but i used to play a lot of and just trying to like figure out why on earth am i playing the game that i don't even like so much uh we realized that me and my sister we realized that that game once you finished a level the next level automatically starts so you don't like exit right so there's just reduced friction so much that we ended up using it that was probably the first time i appreciated the way something was designed 
and um, yeah, I, I don't think my view itself has changed too much, but I think over years I've realized the importance of designing my own life itself, also using a lot of behavioral science there. So for instance, um, I am quite forgetful in general, so I forget to take my vitamin pills, for instance. I put a bottle of water and my vitamin pills right next to my toothbrush because I know for a fact that I want to take it in the morning and I know for a fact that I'm going to brush my teeth. Right. So just sort of tying in behaviors together, for instance, I leave my gym clothes on my bed when I go to bed so that in the morning it just becomes really easy for me to change and leave. Right? And uh, lots of things like if you're not able to wake up in the morning, leave your phone really far away from the bed. So you're designed in a way that you have to get up to get it right. And uh, I tell my friends is that I forget to take my clothes out of the washing machine. I'm pretty sure other people <laughs> have the same problem. And what I do is I just take a large pot or something really odd and leave it in the middle of my living room. So every time I walk by, I know for a fact that something is wrong in the house. Oh, there are clothes in the washing machine that I probably forgot. Things like that. The, these are ways I think we can also influence our own life and design our life in a way that makes things easier. So yeah, that's something that I started you know, doing and also appreciating much later in life. But yeah. Thank you, Professor Chakravarti. Same question. And thanks, you know, for giving us some wonderful ideas of how to take care of things. <laughs> yeah, again, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, like why we grow and why we see things happening constantly on design. Uh, my biggest learning was uh, in my last project, where, where from, from childhood I wanted to design this uh, palkis for the actually carry you know they carry these loads on, on and there's this you know very heavy person sitting on top and then four skinny guys taking the people up the hills on heritage box and like you know it stuck to me so i you know like uh, then i you know uh, took this up on my own and i started designing and then when we started working on the project uh, every time i designed a prototype and went back all the way to vaishnav devi at one go the photos will say nahi chalega and then, you know, like I would come back to a, because it would tell me 10 more problems. Then I'll go back again and solve those 10 problems and take the next prototype and they say, Ye bhi nahi chalega. And they'll tell me 10 more problems. Say, Eki baar pura nahi batate ho. Nahi, aapka prototype aega, to batayenge. <laughs> so, you know, it was so interesting that my eight and then, you know, we had these collaborators from NITI and they were ergonomists. And to my sixth prototype had a backrest for the person who is sitting, right? And they said, no, no, the patron also has to be comfortable. He must have a backrest. And that was the height of rejection from the porters. And they just laughed, looking at the product and said, Tum log to pagal ho. we keep, you know, we make the porters, uh, the, the pilgrims and the patrons, you know, we keep tapping on them, Udjao, Udjao, Kyunki Wagar so jayenge, to palki gir jayega. So it could, it could be at that type of level of, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, sometimes research and ergonomics and all we could do. But finally, the most critical thing is about behavior, like what to be saying, because these guys had 20 years of experience using palki. So they, and they had like zero accidents. So when we, when we design something new, I think it has to be participatory. It has to be in their presence. So finally, I brought four porters to IIT put them in the hostel for three months, designed along with them, and finally the 100 palkis are now flying in Vaishno Devi. So that is the learning for me, that if you cannot have one, one man up shape, you have to be partner, you know, with the with the user, with, when the products are such long-lasting products, yeah. Right, wonderful, thank you. Yeah, I just have a point, uh, uh, Professor Chakravati. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in all my design, the stakeholder as the participatory designer. Exactly. He sits with us, he's, he's paid for, he becomes the alpha sample tester, he does the market testing also, and we have, we have found it much, much cheaper than any market test and bring the stakeholder under you, keep him in a good hotel, he has a good meal, and his brain starts working, and the way they start pointing out at mistakes, the day one your ego gets slaughtered totally to smithrins, <laughs> and you start suspecting whether education was a big scam or something, because this man knows more than you. And uh, it, uh, yeah, but but ultimately we we realize this is in a small domain space. He knows so much of knowledge, but that domain space of knowledge that he has is something we must completely record because it is brilliant. I'm the thing beyond a box. Like a lady in Punjab where we had taken a chula which I designed, 
for burning this stubble and cooking in that. She told me, Pagal kabhi chapati banai ho? I said, I have seen it. So, first chapati banana is seeko, baad mein chula banao. Chalo, yaha se, hato. <laughs> I, I didn't take it as an insult. I said, chalo, aapke chapati khake jayenge. Then after six months, we designed the product. It finally came out. Now it's out in the market. But this is where you must be ready for, okay? Thank you. Great, great. Yeah. Thank you. So now that you have the mic, please. Uh, the last one for the panel. So, what next? What is the next frontier you see in design or design research or where should we look forward to? I, I, I think, as I showed in the second slide, the uh, the pyramid of uh, requirements, we should move a bit from the top red space into the blue space below. It's tremendous opportunities. And we must have a special kind of either a pedagogy or a method where uh, uh, students are taught techniques to harvest problems from the society, compartmentalize, bring about, and make a very clear problem statement as to what element of design would solve this particular issue. And this is where I think the future lies and the world is looking for it. Thank you. Yeah, Milind. Uh, um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the newest craze, which I think is, um, uh, this time it's, I, I, I feel like it's real, right? Which is AI. Uh, and the way AI is sort of, getting into design, right? Uh, I think we need to learn to leverage AI and not not fear it. Uh, and, and I think that I see as the as the next big frontier in design where um, I think with AI, it's going to be a lot about asking the right questions, right? Uh, solving the right problems I, and in that sense I, I align with you right like which is um, what problems do you do you ask uh, AI's help for what what direction do you put uh, AI in because I, I think uh, what I see AI as is is this um, extremely efficient problem solving tool right which means you can now release even more designs in a like what you could do in a month now you could do in a week what you could do in a week now you can do it in a day uh, and if you look at ai as as that um i i think it, it's a good thing but um in general if you don't move there fast enough you'll probably be left in the dust that's that's my uh, that's my feeling so, yeah. I think the maturity of AI will end with the speed of collation of data. And collation of data to an extent, independently thinking, I do not know whether it can match the human brain in the next maybe three decades or four decades. And I would rather accept AI when it can tell me if I can understand a woman or my wife, what is the next act going to be? <laughs> That's when AI has really arrived. OK, thank you. Yeah. Right, Junafi. So what's the next frontier in design? I was going to repeat what Milan said. <laughs> so I agree with him. Um, I also think AI has a lot to offer and the current chat GPT or even the image generation, I feel like it's just scratching the surface. And um, the part that I'm most excited about, even within AI, we, I've also been exploring that space recently a lot. And uh, in the past, if you think about who a good driver and who a bad driver was. A good driver was someone who, of course, drove well, but also that person knew the best routes. That person knew which road to take when, where would be traffic and all of that. The introduction of GPS or Google Maps and all of that has just decreased the distance between a good driver and a bad driver in the sense that nobody no longer has to remember the roads. You no longer has, have to know you know, all this information of which road gets crowded when and all of that, you just follow the map, right? So it kind of brought the difference between a good driver and a bad driver. And that's sort of where I think AI could be helpful. Uh, of course, not right now, but in hopefully in the near future with the speed at which the developments are happening, I'm really optimistic. But I think um, there is a good difference between what a good 
design is and what a bad design is. And I'm hoping that the, the whole concept of bad design or a driver who gets lost would no longer exist in the future at some point. Hopefully that's the goal. So yeah, that, that's what I personally feel. Right, Professor Chakravarti, same question. Uh, you you need to unmute yourself. Uh, we've been watching, you know, this a lot, and, and I feel very strongly that uh, the next uh, forty of designers need to be very perceptive. Uh, you have to be there. Your perception qualities have to be very high. So we have to come up with new methods uh, to see to that our students can observe and perceive much better, and you know, like so that we could take the next leap. <laughs> With all these, uh, new, uh, new new technologies coming up, uh, uh, and then of course uh, you know like the biggest challenge uh, you know is also uh, to actually you know the, what I like about AI and uh, you know uh, uh, the new technologies is that uh, it actually flattens uh, uh, a lot of uh, it actually brings in so much uh, rich data uh, which is relevant to that topic that it's impossible for us individually as a designer to get that data. So it's very collaborative in nature. You're actually collaborating with millions of people, millions of users to come up with solutions. So, so but then, you know, your perception of that, your understanding of that, how you take care of that will become the key for the next generation of designers. Right, wonderful. With that, we'll uh, end the panel session here. We'll take the, some questions. But if you, before I take the questions, I'll sort of just, I, I'll mention that uh, in these 25, 25 events that we are doing, in each of the event, we also bring one batch of alumni starting with the first uh, event first batch second event second batch and so on this is the 12th event and some of our 12th batch alumni have joined uh, some of them are online i think a couple of them are here as well so those who are here are here i'll ask them to please come to the front that is seat in front uh, and the alumni who are online uh, please uh, put your cameras on uh, you can also ask questions to the panelists and once we are done with the questions we'll ask you to talk about yourself what you have been doing since you graduated and what's the journey been like? Uh, we'll wait, uh, we'll ask you to, as I said, come on the camera, but in the meanwhile, we'll take some questions. So, uh, questions, we'll take three to four questions. We don't have a lot of time. So, somebody has to take the mic, please. Vikrant, anyone else from the uh, 12th batch? Uh, my name is Murli. Uh, uh, I'm actually, we were the uh, people who started cycling, Nama Cycling in ISC. I saw his post and uh, I've been like attending a lot of things when I found some uh, design interesting conversation. So my question is to Hiramat sir uh, for uh, uh, the cycle rickshaw that uh, his design actually, uh, because we are trying to create an ecosystem for designing and manufacturing ecosystem of this. So what I observed is uh, 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 instead of, I think uh, uh, the cycle rickshaw itself could have improved, right? So. I think uh, so. Was it an appropriate solution? Uh, is what I think to make him uh, shift from his uh, profession of uh, taking the people uh, to making him. <laughs> so I uh, just uh, have a question about that uh, solution adapted. Second uh, question should I ask now or like after this solution? Yeah, you can go ahead in one uh, okay, so uh, uh, to the, uh, I think you've got a great product uh, because uh, a lot of my friends, we promote cycling and uh, apart from that, we also, my friend network is also promoting your product, uh, Deepak Maji Patel and all. So, uh, so my question is to the other guys, uh, uh, how, how much uh, time was it involved to get into the actual product, like uh, design for manufacturability, right? How do you, because uh, that's where we are seeing that's a gap, right? How do you kind of like uh, bridge that pipeline? How do you, so how much time does it take? And just, just how, what is it that makes the ecosystem just in three sentences? That ecosystem journey, if you can just mention it, thank you. Well, to answer your first question, <clears throat> the uh, reason why the cycle rickshaw was redesigned was not to make a better cycle rickshaw. They were completely displaced off the road. The real estate they occupied on the road and the speed with which they operated was a hindrance for the traffic movement. While it's badly designed road, somebody else got you know uh, connected with it and they were thrown out of the roads. And uh, in no city today except you know a few uh, towns across India, cyclists exist because they really do hinder traffic movement. That was the reason. And the question is, these people had to be rehabilitated. And 
government has the money not the will to rehabilitate them then this came about uh, enterprise and then uh, that's how it connected okay i hope i answered your question yeah hey, uh, so um regarding the second question right um it takes incredible amount of time uh, to design for manufacturing if you have actually is gone to manufacturing without thinking about it in the first place right and the first generation of ether was designed by like uh, out of the first about 250 folks there were 240 engineers equivalent right we had probably two folks in business and uh, some other people who just like paid salaries and all of that right um when you design a product that way where a bunch of passionate engineers are asked to like just build the the best uh, best product out there right a uh, bunch of passionate designers sort of and and engineers right um you you get products which are non manufacturable extremely expensive uh and yeah like all sorts of problems right um if you design for manufacturing from the beginning right uh it's not that hard uh it's actually just it it just becomes part of your dna um so just to give you some context in the next product that we have our timelines don't increase because we design for manufacturing it's just one of those things that you have to figure out and the way we do it is again we talk a lot about customer empathy uh ether works on extreme stakeholder empathy which means that a designer a manufacturer an engineer uh like a manufacturing engineer uh, all of these folks right uh work in one group we call it swim lane right uh but from the start of the project to end of the project um all of like your your team is not industrial design or manufacturing engineering your team is battery your team is uh like motor so everything that it takes to build a motor uh which includes procurement by the way like our our procurement folks uh strategic sourcing folks sit with designers uh to sometimes help them like get the right uh right tech for designing and sometimes just like procure the right tech 2 years in advance uh to to sort of build so that it it can make it to production right so that way we are now extremely focused on outcomes and the outcome that we want is like a like a manufacturable product that people love right uh, and once you take that as a design challenge right uh we've we've designed an organization around it right and once you do that it's it's not that difficult so my, my suggestion is to all of this question because we we'll take a couple of other question uh yeah right uh the question is more towards the art of persuasion like when we are want to put our word across to someone else in the team or to another team how much of it is to be backed by information how much at at what time do we transition it to an emotion based backing and Directly, open uh, it's open to the panel. Like he was also mentioning about the fights that happen in ether between the teams, to persuading the other people on believing that what you do is right. How much of it is information and how much of it is your behavior versus emotion? Um, you, uh, if if you want to be the second type of person whose emotions can carry an entire organization, you'll have to wait a while, right? Like. there are people who i know uh, there are people such people exist right but they get there by by proving uh, their their worth right uh, like um whatever um hiramat sir sort of will say today right versus what he would have said like 30 years back there is very different value of his emotions his his words like and today if he said something you'll take it at face value like you'll say ha huh, like I, i you may ask a question but you will not debate too hard with it if he says no i i know this don't ask me how right but at 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 your level right what i would urge you to do is learn to um 
learn to articulate what you what you are really feeling right where does uh where does good design come from why do you feel this design is good right and one of the things that sort of stuck with me when when uh like when i was actually building the charger and uh, uh I, i was sitting with our head designer and um I, i i wanted to push like i wanted to get a lot of space which would have made the vehicle look ugly right and um the designer just sat with me and like and i also like i like i i spent hours with him understanding why it mattered why those lines mattered why does negative space matter like i i had no business knowing uh how does negative space interact with your vehicle to sort of give you that sense of uh like give you that sense of like sharpness of the vehicle right and i was meddling with that negative space that's what i was doing right and that's when i realized that oh like i shouldn't be doing this right and and so he was able to articulate what great design was right so you can't say hey i'm emotional about this uh, this is great right you have to you have to you have to figure out what's great uh, you have to say it in a in in a manner that somebody understands it other than a designer right which is where stakeholder empathy comes into picture like the way you talk to a ceo versus way you talk to like a product head versus a way you talk to like a manufacturing engineer completely different empathies and that's what but but you have to make everybody care that's that's uh, and, and yeah in that sense the second answer which is can't say i'm emotional so i i yeah yeah please go ahead uh hello milan uh i don't know if i came in a little late so i don't know uh if you told to mention this already so uh around 8 years back tarun was here in the same room and he was here for a mock presentation uh, uh for ether and at that stage i think it was in a very rudimentary stage like you were modifying one uh, existing scooter and like was running yeah that stage yeah <laughs> and tarun was like so humble he listened to everyone and like you know and it's 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 so good to see you here after so many years and your company has grown to this level so congratulations to you and your team and to tarun <laughs> uh so i don't think that um, interview or uh, the presentation went well that day <laughs> but in spite of that like you are here and can we Yeah Short, the question yeah. question is the, question. Uh, the one question i asked him that day like why do you think it's a time for uh, electric vehicles already and it's not the first time electric vehicles were introduced uh, particularly considering the battery lithium scenario so uh, particularly considering the lithium ion scenario so sir maybe you could also answer this is it regarding batteries yeah why is the Why do, why do like, are we ready for electric technology? Not per se, because uh, what so what's basically happening is a lot of manufacturers are still experimenting with batteries. In the sense, it is not maturing yet. The scale of economies is what will mature it. Until it matures, they will not accept it. Every every week or 15 days, there is a new news of a new battery which is going to have more cycles built into it, faster charging cycle, and uh, easier disposability and easier adaptability to circular economy so the end of life thing is something which is a very big question for evs also so this is where the question is going to come and uh, uh, eventually the motor has already matured itself to a fantastic stage where it is possibly the best looking thing in terms of vldc controllers have come to a very very fairly mature stage it's only the battery which is playing the trick because it's always a feeling in one's mind in a ev how long is it going to last and uh, reading the battery life is also a bit tricky you really don't know whether there's 30% left actually or it is 29 or 26 that, that also a bit tricky they are all still fighting it out a lot of design uh, thinking is going on designers are putting efforts into it we will arrive there very soon uh, i am of slightly different opinion in the sense that um i won't disagree with it right like it's not at a stage where it's it's extremely mature right uh but uh 
any technology adoption is a chicken and egg problem unless you actually adopt the technology it will never hit economies of scale until it hit its economies of scale it will never come at a cost that it can get adopted right and that's why you need a bunch of startups to sort of uh, make the leap right uh, and 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 that's where um if if there was no ether uh, i i don't think from a um, from a from an existing legacy oem you would have seen electric because they would always be asking this question and and giving an answer that no the tech is not ready for us to invest in it yet right uh, but you need a startup to sort of break that right and if you look at now where uh, the industry is right uh, maybe the industry as a whole two wheeler industry is probably at a 3 4% penetration of evs but if you look uh, deeper into um into like an like a scooter market where it's uh it's a very uh urban commute problem city which is beautifully placed to 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 be solved through an ev there you will see about 14% penetration which is already going into like an early majority sort of a space right if you go further and look into like a city like bangalore which uh where you will see more than 25 30% penetration of evs which uh if you look at state like kerala you will see similar penetrations uh, for evs right and these are uh, states and cities which the rest of india sort of tends to follow so um in terms of what's happening with evs uh, i i think i believe the time is right uh in terms of i, I think the perfect mature technology where uh, probably no like an ev industry can sustain without subsidy is a couple of years away um so so that sustainable businesses can come out of it without any subsidy but in terms of tech i think if you if you know how to use a uh, tech well right um i i think i think uh, the tech is where uh, tech is at a place where you can build batteries uh, products with like entire products which uh, which can run beautifully well right and like if if you take a battery there is there is a way as he has shown in through his products right there is a way for the way to make batteries last like years and years and like probably decades uh Uh, but but you have to design for it right and 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 that care once you are willing to take yeah i, th- I think the tech is there so, yeah. thank you uh, and i think with that we'll uh, sort of close this q and a session as well uh, as i am again requesting the uh, alumni the 12th uh, batch to come on screen and we'll maybe start with uh, vikrant to break the ice so uh, if we can pan the camera to vikrant and i'll give him the mic to him can you please pass on the mic so vikrant and all those guys aman uh, devesh urvesh uh please come on the camera and again as i said uh, it will be good to hear from you what you have been doing since you graduated where you are what you have been doing and vikrant is figuring out how to switch on the mic it's working all right now. there it is all right yes all yours uh, hello everyone i'm vikrant and i am from the 2008 to 10 batch And it's really fortunate that I'm here in Bangalore at the same time, and I'm also from Bangalore, so I was here for a vacation, so I just popped in. And uh, yeah, so during my masters, I sort of got interest towards medical devices. I think it was starting from the course of applied ergonomics. It started from there, and then I did a lot of internships at the respective department in biomechanics. And after my masters, I worked for a couple of years to figure out whether I want to do a PhD and if yes, in what topic. And then I picked uh, biomedical engineering to be the topic for my PhD. and then i got uh, went to oxford for a phd with a with a full funding and after my phd uh, my work was on sort of understanding the movement patterns of prosthetic limb usage and then after that i did a couple of post docs on uh, designing prosthetic devices and now i just recently got a fellowship at manchester where i'll be moving to moving as a university fellow and i'll be working on global health rehab technologies prosthetics and i'll be sort of establishing my own group there and so that's my journey so far over the last 12 13 years um yeah wonderful All right, now you guys fight out who goes first and who goes last. Maybe I'm, we'll go alphabetically if that's okay. Aman. 
Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so journey journey has been long and uh, very enriching. And so currently, I'm heading product design and uh, product design and management in at Cams Rep. So Cams Rep is a uh, is a subsidiary of Cams, so Computer Age Management System. So uh, if anyone has bought a mutual fund, uh, you would have come across Cams. Uh, so uh, I, I'm making like uh, I'm now leading their digital platform for where we are trying to create a repository uh, based digital platform for insurance, and uh, and uh, we are trying to build new stuff, uh, bringing the power of aggregation, bringing the power of digital, as well as uh, also trying to uh, connect to the to the general public. Bringing the benefits of an insurance alive, so so that's the kind of uh, work at the moment I'm working on. Uh, yeah, and I would have happy to answer questions. Great, great. All right, Devesh. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hi, 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 everyone. My name is Devesh. Uh, I have been part of three companies since the time I graduated from MDES. Uh, initially, I was in Ashok Leyland for three years. Then I was in Crompton for three years. And since last five years, I've been at Ecofrost Technologies. Uh, currently, I'm leading the design team here. Uh, it's leading the both manufacturing and the industrial design team. Uh, we are basically responsible for all the mechanical aspects as well as the user uh, interaction points of our products. Uh, currently, the two products that we make are mainly portable solar based cold rooms and solar based uh, pump controllers or uh, pump combos, uh, which is used for irrigation purposes. Yeah, that's all from my side. Nice, that was very nice. All right, we have got a third guy there. Urvesh, hello, all yours. Hello, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah, please go. Yeah. Yeah, good evening, everyone, and uh, pleasure to be here and see uh, all of you. Uh, really delighted to uh, listen to all the experts also. Uh, so, uh, since uh, uh, the CPDM, I've been with uh, five to six companies. Initially, uh, thought of starting something of my own uh, and working with uh, younger, say, design studios wherein I can have a, uh, say, uh, opportunity of having a partnership kind of role. Uh, slowly moved on to larger organizations, and uh, currently I'm with Godrej uh, for last uh, eight years, working uh, in innovation cell. Currently, we are working on new product planning and innovation. So uh, one thing which I had sort of say realized or observed was uh, apart from say building products, it was also important for designers to learn how to sell them or how to bring them to market, how to plan their GTM. And uh, that is what I'm currently trying to uh, learn and do also. So learning to build and learning to sell uh, is something that I uh, take inspiration from Naval Ravikan. And yeah, that is what I wish to do going ahead also learning every day, every single day. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful, great. Uh, thank you all. I think uh, we'd have loved to see more of your batch here, but uh, that's still not a bad ratio. No, those are uh, our own folks, yeah. All right, so uh, that's wonderful to hear. Uh, just to sort of remind you all uh, that we'll have an alumni meet where we'll expect all 25 batches to come eventually once we have done this 25 rounds. Uh, I think with that, uh, we are sort of running out of time. So we'll come, we are coming to the close of the session and I'll invite Professor Chakravarti to uh, please, uh, you know, commemorate our uh, sort of guests uh, with uh, design ambassador certificates and mementos. So. Okay, uh, well, first of all, I would like to thank uh, thank uh, Professor Vishal and his team for organizing this. Just before I uh, 
hand this out and and um, and, and then of course I would like to thank all of you, both my good friend uh, Professor Chakravarti from IIT Bombay, uh, uh, and and all the other speakers who have been very kind to to share their rich and very uh, diverse experiences with us. We have been enriched. And uh, so my sincere thanks to all of you. And then, of course, the wonderful audience that we have uh, from not only the current batches of students, but also my colleagues and some of the alumni ex-students uh, from this special batch. So thank you all very much. And with that, I would like to uh, just uh, have the present uh, duty of uh, handing over the the um, CPDM Design Ambassador uh, award to my colleagues here. So first one uh, is to uh, uh, yeah. So we have two things here. Uh, yeah, you hold it there. Okay, right. So one is a little memento that says CPDM 25, and the other is the certificate. So uh, first to Dr. Hiramat. And, and the next to, of course, uh, bring the mic closer. Yeah. 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 So uh, to Milanji. So here is uh, a little moment to remind us. And of course, those who are online will have to dispatch that to you, uh, and then hopefully that will re you will receive it in it. So thank you all very much. And uh, I don't know if there is still coffee left, but I hope all of you have received it. But in case. You want to pack, uh, pick another one, maybe just outside. Yeah. So I'll see you in three weeks then for the next one, right? Yeah. Thank you all very much. Of course, you can stay back and you know discuss. If you have questions, I'm sure there are more questions. So feel free to catch them un until they have to catch their. Yeah. Thank you. That was very, very good. That was wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. One of the most. Thank you. I it was great. Yes, yes, we'll, we'll anyways keep in touch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.